Welcome to City Stories Workshop final reading. This is a collaboration between Counterpulse and San Francisco Creative Writing Institute. We're really honored to be here and connect with Counterpulse and offer free classes to the community in creative writing. And I'm honored to be uh, named as a, a artist in residence for November and December. And we just, we started our workshop, uh, our reading with a little bit of a workshop. And that's sort of the way I can give my art back to the community. Part of my art is teaching. So even though it's also writing, but I, I wanted to share it. So I thought I would do it this way. So I, I'm inviting you all to, to write a little bit in the, in the reading, which is a little unconventional. And then because we're recording this, if you feel like you don't want to be on the recording, just tell me before you go and I'm happy to pause it. Uh, let me know if you want me to pause. Okay. So let's hear what you wrote and then just let me know. And if you have to leave early, that's totally fine. And we, we understand because this is a lunch hour community class. I can fear. So I live on the um, borders between, well, Lower Knob Hill, which is been called the Tender Knob. It's between Tenderloin and Knob Hill. I miss, from what I've heard that Knob Hill is one of more the affluent, affluent neighborhood. So this is what I wrote. I live on the coast between the have and the have nots on the borders between a solid roof and a makeshift tent. I come from having nothing to having something, striving to make it to the top of the hill. Is that ambition wrong? Why does it feel like I'm abandoning something? Perhaps a memory that places me back to nothing. And my eye, that's just a fragment. I'm, I, I couldn't think anymore after that. Thank I've, you. I really like that. Can you read it again? I live on the cusp between the have and the have nots, on the borders between a solid roof and a makeshift tent. I come from having nothing to having something, striving to make it at the top of the hill. Is that ambition wrong? Why does it feel like I'm abandoning something? Perhaps a memory that places me back to nothing. I really like the idea of, it. I, I love the, you have a kind of like beautiful way of putting in sort of like, like fire in your writing. That's really nice. Like maybe when you read it out loud, it comes out even more but I live on the cusp of having something, the haves and the have nots and the solid roof and the makeshift tent and the, maybe maybe it's all that striving. It's really good. And it also, it, it I could see the beginning of internal conflict, you know, and I wanted to know more about that and the internal conflict of like trying to make it. A Antoinette is saying beautiful. And I'm so sorry, this is such a different experience than in person. Because in person, we would be talking, of course, we've never seen each other's face, because we always had a mask, but now you know what it looked like. But, uh, but we, you know, like, it's, it's hard, feel free to like chime in in the chat and unmute yourself anytime. I don't mind. Um, it's not the same as being together in a physical space, but it we can we can make it work. Yeah, it is. It was beautiful. I, Giselle, I want to hear more. Just keep going to that that place. Okay, good. Let's hear another. Does anyone else want to read? Can I make? Oh, sure. Go ahead and make a comment. Yeah, I really love that last line. I think it was roots coming from their throats. Um, and I really. You know, these stories and when people often write about gentrification, they never really hold any people accountable. It's like, we all know someone that was abused, but we don't know any abusers, you know? So you kind of really held, put a name to like what gentrif who gentrifiers are and you named like a, I guess an agent in that. So um, I, I appreciated that. So thank you. I guess I was also trying to take their power by saying that they're fake and they don't exist. Yeah, like they're pretend and that they're, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. Good. So uh, welcome Tongo, Ice and Martin. If you're just joining us, we, we're having a class at the beginning of our reading 
And just to kind of get us going, since we were a free class in San Francisco, and I gave a writing prompt that was right about two elements of conflict in the city. And it could be uh, entities, it could be people, but it, and it, it can be poetry, it could be prose, and then everyone free wrote. And now, Ak, you're going to read your piece, right? Okay, and oh, if people don't want to be recorded, you can tell me and I'll pause and then you won't be. Yeah, sorry. Um, you know what's interesting? Um, this morning, um, I, I wanted to invite my friend to this reading, I told you, because we mm -hmm. thought it would be live and I mentioned that to you. And um, so it was kind of free writing because I had to write her an email to tell her it wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I was writing about the location. So it's similar. So can I just read that? Because I yeah. said, oh, wow, it's it's kind of lines of what you were asking us to do. <laughs> our writer's group won't be live today. The teacher opted our final reading over Zoom and or the phone today. She said it had to do with the weather. I think it has more to do with negotiating the battlefield that is the Tenderloin homelessness, drug use, shit and pee, doing drugs overtly like that shit, doing drugs overtly, like that should not be excused. Shooting needles, smoking crack, smoking pipes, drug deals. To think that I have even been afraid to take a swig of alcohol in, in public. At the Champs-Elysees in Paris on my last trip in August, 2019, Paul and I strolled down the famed avenue dotted with luxury boutiques. There was a chunky middle-aged Arab woman clad in her black cover-up wardrobe. She had been panhandling, but then she decided to lie down in the middle of the pedestrian heavy street. She wasn't praying, she wasn't prostrating. She laid her body down on the ground. Perhaps it was her way of protesting the divide between the haves and the have-nots. The woe is me proclamation. Pedestrians near her had to skirt her. She would get up, walk a few steps, and lie herself down again, making sure her message was broadcasted. People sitting at the cafe saw her act and contorted their faces. And suddenly, a roving pack of uniformed and armed militia showed up. The closest soldier, with his Uzi at his grip, simply said the word, Madam! She bolted right up to her feet and started to back off. I imagine they could arrest her, but all it took was one soldier and a pack of six with a stern voice, a warning that this was not to be tolerated. While this woman wasn't high, wasn't overtly consuming drugs, her mental stance was questionable, but she was also balanced enough to fear the law. Paul and I saw these soldiers all over France during our three week vacation. They were at all the landmarks and monuments. They were at the train and subway stations. I smiled cheekily whenever I saw them. And one early morning, I even tried to buy a pack of them breakfast while we were all standing in line at a train station's bakery. Fraternité, I said, and flashed my paratrooper shoulder tattoo so they knew I was one of them. With the uh, shootings that are ever common in the States, my partner and I said to imagine if we had this type of patrol in the US. Picture an active shooter in a mall, in a school, one of several of the six armed soldiers could prevent mass fatalities. One shot, one kill. It's really interesting way that you wove in your, your own experience as a soldier. Um, I feel like there's more there, especially with the tattoo and you, your part of the military has a special tattoo, right, Jennifer? I just opted to get that paratrooper badge. Oh, but in, it, so you, so it's a special badge for the paratroopers and those are the people who jump out of the airplanes, right? Right. Okay. Because women were not really allowed to go earlier. Um, not, I mean, we were, but combat roles in the past were not given to us. And so it wasn't something that, um, you know, they didn't encourage women to go. It was mostly men. So, um, but when you graduate, you get pinned with the badge, which is a parachute with wings and you get that on your uniform. So I, for fun, I got that as a tattoo when I decided I wanted a tattoo. What did the soldier say when you showed him your tattoo? Uh, 
but for that morning, it was just, hey, I want to buy you guys breakfast and I'm one of you guys. And, you know, a lot of times they raise their eyebrows like, is it you? Is it a boyfriend? Is it your husband, your father, your, you know, brother? Always someone related to me, but not me. Mm -hmm. um, but anyhow, the, I mean, there's that whole language thing, having to communicate to them in French. And so it was simply, they said, no, we have government cards. Like our breakfast is paid for, but thank you. Is it, was this during the pandemic? August, 2019. Oh, right before. before the pandemic, I was able to get out there August, 2019, right? We shut down in March, 2020. I think we discovered it around January 2020 or prior. That's why they call it COVID-19. Right, right. Interesting. Thank you for sharing. Okay, let's start the reading. Um, I think that's a good way to start because that's kind of a pre-done piece. Who else has a piece they want to read? And then I want to introduce you guys to our special guests. I've invited two poets who I admire. And I'd love to tell you a little bit more about them, but I, I want to hear more of your work first. Who wants to go next? I, my, the people who signed up on the list to read are all not here yet. So I don't know what happened, but, uh, oh, I see the, one of them is sick and the other one is in a meeting for uh, an important meeting that can't be missed for housing. So that's okay so we'll so these just... these pieces that we're going to read are those that were generated in the workshop yeah it can be something else too mm -hmm. well i guess i'll go because uh nobody else is and i'm talking so if that's okay <laughs> i will um okay so i'm going to read uh a two that were generated in the workshop and one of them well, I don't know. I don't know. One of them's not very good, <laughs> but I'm going to read it anyway because it wasn't very good when I started it and then I fixed it and we'll see how what the reaction is. OK, OK, OK. Um, so it's called Shopping Day and you might remember it. It was in the workshop. Um, so there was a two foot gap at the bottom of the escalator with no time to think we had to leap. One foot outstretched, we resembled a crew of dancers descending. We were male gendered identified trousers below the butt. We were nearly invisible elders. We were young moms hesitant to force the kids off the last platform. It was as if the end of an era or the end of the pandemic had dropped into that gap and all we could do was jump to the other side. No alternative, we jumped or faltered and either way we got off the tram intact. Systems sometimes engineered for mishap, yet humans always adapt. iPhones in hand, book bags fastened. We cleared the drop, sometimes by just an eighth of an inch. We landed on our feet, mostly, and we're glad that we could. Cannabis lovers would have us believe in our own superpowers, reimagining a world where equality in all forms was the status quo. Present to this instant, letting go, lifting off, jumping ship, making room at the end of the escalator, we feel our own needs ignored in capitalism and consumerism. Alternatively, we foster trust in humanity and ourselves when we reach out, grab a hand, jump over the two foot gap that brings us all together. What was that? <laughs> anyway, I, I'll read another one. Is that okay? Yeah, keep going. Okay. So then uh, here's another one that was uh, generated in that workshop and it, I, I changed it a lot. It goes, um, it's, it's uh, called breakdancing in the kitchen. Fear rolls into anger, looking for balance while fixing food for thought bounces off windows, free-spirited, provocateur of guilty pleasure, synthesized annoyances, tumultuous thunder, in concert, hollow, eerie, caw, 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 balanced on overhead wires, drenched in black, feathers droop undercover, ready for farewells, we're warm where we are, walking barefoot on wet 
acorns, listen to the rainfall, deep purple puddles sound the end in the light well. At night, I wonder who hears us snoring above clouds, shrill self self-care, penetrating ozone, blasted between dormant firmament, breezy stratosphere, where we breathe, knowing nothing for certain except for science and love. That was awesome. Ah, thank you. I like the second one better. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm a poet. I'm not really a prose writer, but um, yeah, thank you. But I like the first one. I, I was trying to, people were texting me while you were about getting into the building and I was like, oh, here we're on Zoom, dodge into a cafe. But uh, uh, so that was why I didn't uh, comment because it was happening as we were reading. But I, I thought that you, I was wondering what you changed. And I think you added more detail to the first one and more like sort of a fullness. I did. And when I finished reading it in the workshop, you were like, tell me more. Where were they? What happened? You know, so I kind of introduced the gap in the beginning and, um, and then I took out quite a bit because it really was kind of wandering all over the place. So that, and I did, you know, just, just tighten it up a little bit, but I'm still not really pleased with it, but thank you. I like it. I think it's coming together, but the second one, the second one had a punch to it. I yeah. love from the part where the dormant firmament to the, all the way to the end was awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anyone else want to read? I think this is a good time to introduce our guests. So I would like to, and I brought two poets whose work I admire. One I'm just getting to know, and I'll introduce him first. And I and invited a third poet, but she couldn't make it. But I, I invited Anthony Fangari and Tongo Eisen Martin. I'll, I'll tell you, they're, um, they're there waving in the, in the gallery. And I'll tell you a little bit about what I know about Anthony Fangari. Anthony is a Coptic poet, meaning that his background is Egyptian and, uh, Eastern Orthodox, which I found interesting being Greek, a Greek poet. And uh, he lives in the Tenderloin and works in the arts and got a grant to put together his first book of poetry, which he's currently putting together. And yeah, and that's, uh, and we had this weird stuff in common, like we, his grandmother like, grew up on the same block, like three blocks from where I grew up or lived on three blocks from where I grew up. And we used to shop at the same Arabic market is really 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 far out it's like, but that's uh, really cool too so uh, without further ado i'd like to introduce you to anthony fangari and anthony please read us some of your poems to inspire us oh, that was a very generous and kind uh, introduction i appreciate it and i really love the what you're doing here this is fantastic and i've heard so much about the project and i'm really happy to have finally connected with you and um you know meet so many awesome writers and be exposed to their work um, also it's good to see my friend Tongo again too, but, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to read a couple poems if you folks don't mind. Um, let me find it. Okay. Um, this is Hoof, which means fear. Never forget your mother woke you that morning. You ran to the TV. She said explosions, a tower collapsing into itself, a structure of sand, aware where you stood, how flags can flash like hammers, fabric and colors can beg. Never forget learning you were Arab. The first time letters collapsed onto you like soil. Never forget hating yourself, your food, music, name, what burnt knuckle hair smelt like, your mother dyed her hair blonde, plucked your eyebrows into slivers. Never forget the wet wrinkle in her scream when the second tower fell, that it meant something was to come. Your parents changed their names, airplanes, random security checks, being accused of trying to start a caliphate, learning the word caliphate, the photo of Pope Shenouda, the trigger pull that followed. Never forget learning about Afghanistan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Palestine. How you, your Persian friend, your, Af your Afghan friend, started a tagging crew called Arabs with Attitude, though none of you were Arab. White kids wanted to join. 
You told him they had to get jumped in. How easily abdomens give to driving knees. How pink white flesh can flush when they first said never forget and how bad you wish they would. When your friend's dad said they need to just nuke all the fucking Arabs. How stiff his jaw looked. The terror in your father's eyes when he saw you wearing a shirt that said diamond in Arabic. How he calls you every time there's a mass shooter. How he begs you to shave your face. How 14 people were killed near your house in San Bernardino. He begs you to shave your face. Never forget when your father told us that we deserve this. We change the way the world travels. No other people have done this before. We have nothing to be proud of. Um, this is them, uh, Arabic for blood. There were soldiers outside of the monastery in Old Cairo the day after Christmas. Barricades, metal detectors, AK-47s at hand with an extra clip taped or zip tied upside down so they can reload faster when the militants come. Tattoos of Coptic crosses on the right wrists are the only way to tell it's apart. My bare wrist made them worry as martyrdom stains faith blotched in blood, ink, names, altars. The red represents the bloodshed wool. We wrap ourselves in the fabric of our dead sheep. Militants stop, buses full of cops. And that's, that's cops as in Coptic people. Uh, militants stop, buses full of cops. Unload in the middle of the Sahara. Buses full of brown eyes, curly hair, just like theirs. Melon balled raw. Militants drive off empty shells and empty eyes peppered across strands of sand. We wear martyrdom like perfume. Children carry the names like petrol sticking to skin, like extra clips taped or zip tied upside down. Um, this is England. Dear England, I told a Saidi joke at my grandfather's eulogy. Imagine that. A room full of Egyptians mourning and laughing in English, speaking your spill, motor oil silting. We hear you in every word, England. Strung out in the room, gripping a map of Africa with one hand and a butter knife in the other, scraping names and blotting lines. Gidu told me an English soldier killed his father after the occupation. Two generations later, we are in this room, jowls marred by that same bullet. Your language always held like heavy rocks in Gidu's mouth, wilted his words into flaps of themselves. He would call me Choaga laugh at my weak tongue, and I think of shells splitting cobras, my family from the mouth. Um, America, I was 17 and blacked out, relieving myself on a tree, and you tackled me, it was poetic, the red and blue lights flashing with the warmth of urine on my leg, while your knee drove into my spine, I was American for the first time, I was yours. Um, and then I'll read one last one, uh, if that's OK. Um, this is called Khanzir, which means pigs. The only Coptic neighborhood in Cairo is located on the city's dump, Zebelin, which translates to garbage people. My grandfather left Hetaleya before the, before the soil staled and the governor of Cairo decreed the pigs unclean, sending the pig farmers to live and work on the dump. The Coptic Falahin became Zebelin. Yet I'm afraid to order something without bacon in front of white people, as someone will always say, oh, because you're Muslim, right? I won't always correct them, because some white people just need a Muslim friend. Yet the fear of scorpions and snakes would keep my grandmother's eyes unlatched. She would lock onto her children like an ostrich watching her eggs. Yet adolescent pigeons are killed just before flight so that their bones are tender enough to chew. Yet I feel stripped when my blunt wraps come crisp like shrimp skin. Yet my father bought a golden necklace after 9-11. He said, when white people see my cross, they won't think I'm a terrorist. 
Yet the pig is depicted in different hieroglyphs, licking the faces of pharaohs, locked in limestone forever. Yet I heard a Coptic man applaud the Muslim ban, holding on to trauma soaked from minya. Yet adolescent bones crushed with concession. Yet sleep is a privilege. Yet bacon ruins the taste of everything. And I'll eat it anyways. Yet we laugh, dad, the type of white people that will attack you aren't the type to notice the cross around your neck. Yet Cairo's dump is located on a Coptic church. Yet Morsi killed all the pigs in Egypt. The only meat most cops can afford. Yet I hate when my blunts burn too fast. Yet my father remembers watching three houses burn and six men die for their faith one night in Petaleya. Yet the Crusades was a race war in Egypt. Yet we prayed that the Vegas, yet we prayed that the Vegas shooter didn't look like us. Yet God doesn't die. Yet I sleep. Yet snakes and scorpions chiseled my grandmother's focus to a string. Thank you. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for reading. Thank and you. For the, and the I like this. Um, there's not enough writing from the Coptic perspective. Um, we need more. Good job. Thank you. Okay, so if you're just joining us, I'm sorry, I saw that one person thought that the class that the reading was in person, Stephanie, and I'm glad that you found a place, a quiet place to sit and set up your phone. And if you want to read something, feel free. We're just, I'm in, I invited special guests to this class uh, reading, and one of them just read, his name is Anthony Fangari, he's a Coptic poet from San Francisco, and now I'd like to invite our my next special guest, and it's I didn't I I like wanted to tell you guys I invited the poet laureate of San Francisco, but then I didn't want to scare you into not reading. So I I, I I'm not doing the proper honorific of the poet laureate, but let me do it now and uh, welcome Tongo Ice and Martin, poet laureate of San Francisco, a very cool and kind person and interesting writer. He has a, a book out with City Lights Press called Blood on the Fog. And we welcome him to read his work and share it with you guys as an inspiration for you moving forward. Um, you all prayed so perfectly just now in the growing San Francisco language tomorrow we start again with the gold. New neighbors in a trance of spiritual infancy, newspaper people describing the way the non-white class body stretches out on benches, how the city will sit you down next to the kindest alcoholism. Spare fanaticism, a steal in the shooting gallery that becomes a shooting gallery or the next vaudeville Congress accordingly. Newspaper people wanting in on underground gambling shacks maybe even in on sensible proletariat retribution, perfectly from your lips to courthouse tiles, the revolution that devils do discovered by young artists in the complexity of passing, predictable, anti-elder, easy to kill, illegitimate to Africa, white counterculture like a lighthouse in the middle of a prison, or ageless joke about how well religions work where white authors have been, Dreamscape for the petty bourgeoisie who have tempers but not dance for tempers, who have to write fiction to redeem a neighborhood mauling, write myths about how the jungle makes its faces, makes its passports to the shelter system, mauling page after page delivered to powerlessness, sweet honey county line terrorism takes your neighbors, the apostle brain matter what buckets are made for, pray over these buckets, comment on slavery, Loosen the white supply of whiskey, supply of white city. Why not shower with light? Really clean the blood off of your shoes and walled off language quotes from the newer undergrounds. The white movie drags on a ton of limbs made into one glass rim into a music of compassion or star in the minds of the addicts who really count out here. When they talk about the summer, they make it sound like birds of prey were involved. Our next duet back in San Francisco, making money off of drugs again in a symmetry of rage, breaking the news that the city did not have to die young. Now, San Francisco police chief says, yes, you poets make points, but they are all silly. 
<laughs> police chief sewing a mouth onto a mouth. Police chief looking straight through the port. Flesh market both sides of the levy. Change of plans both sides of the nonviolence. On no earth, just an earth character. His subordinate says, Awkward basketball moves look good on you, sir. Yes, we are everywhere, sir. Yes, unfortunately for now, white people only have black history. We will slide the wallpaper right into their cereal bowl, sir. Surveil the shuffle. I'm a beggar. And all of this day is too easy. I want to see all the phases of a wall. Every age it goes through. It's humanity. It's environmental racism. We call this the ordeal blues. Now crawl to the piano seat and make a blanket for yourself. Paint scenes of a child dancing up to the court appearance and leaving a adult but not for home. Atlantic Ocean charts mixed in with parole papers. Mainstream funding the ruling class only pacifism. Ruling class printing judges. Fiat kangaroos making judges hand over fists. Rapture cop packs and opposition whites all above a thorny stem. Cast plans picked out like vans for the murder show. Anglo saints addicting you to a power structure. You want me to raise a little slave, don't you? Bash his little brain in and send him to your civil rights. No pain, just a white pain. Delicate bullets in a box next to a stack of monolith scriptures. Make these bullets look relevant, don't it? I remember you. Everywhere you lay your hat is the capital of the South. The posture you introduce to that fence, the fence you introduce to political theory. If you shred my dream, son, I will tack you to gun smoke. The suburbs are finally offended. This will be a meditation too. My failing as a jail spirit or specific custody for me, monk. Almost a fist through the marquee, they beat me like old pearls in the riverbanks of an assortment of black latitude. So many stabbed up instruments, nothing left of us but sweet Chicago rage. 1919, monk, my first poem as a white man. And all I see is a depopulated and obedient abyss twisting to the metronome ticks of my mother and father and baby prison society. God doesn't even seem possible. I run every street. I light every cigarette. I conjure body language and don't call it the South. I live in someone's terrified arms. There are these 1820s church pews unpainting themselves. There are these cracker doves. And the prison just keeps getting older and older. And I know you have to be a genius, you know. Invite the devil into reconstruction. You have to chase music. Even while you're dying, my conscience is clean, but still not the blues. More gallant rats in the death mass than fits millions. Do you find me morbid, monk? I woke up on a battlefield and also looking down from the crystal of a wind chime, I was a rooftop without a city, trying to figure out the right thing to do with my spare chain subtext, clinking coins, dialoguing like God's efforts. The carpenter's body was black, right? Underground body, simile nothing, abstraction nothing. It's society tied, detested and forgiven in this universe, letting me try my mind again. The police pantry was well stocked and there I was, not participating in street life, my hands far from the self-talk. You could actually see police leverage bobbing up and down in a nuclear harbor. You could see flattened massacres of black people. The biography's done, neatly stapped on top of my infant body, sleeping through my first imperialist summer. Hospital floor swept up of all 10 million bullets. My conscience in bullet and, and drum patterns and drum patterns. Strangely perceived no home away from police insecurities, no working class artifacts, just the state mythos and his love balladeers. Europe serving two masters. Maybe 200,000 in a minor Christ, someone begging for change next to biography, stomachs pumped next to biography. I had all these seven day candles lit, monk. And I knew I was just not getting it. I mean, the pain was just not sliding down the notes right, not saving someone's world, just odd walls of fear asking, what is there actually a true self between these mildly confident walls, recalling how the front of the body feels outside, social contracts, well dressed and courted shrewdly stabbed that shrewdly <laughs> the end <laughs> that's amazing it's beautiful i love the I, I always love how you talk to another unseen figure in your poetry and i love this monk who's is monk right m-o-n-k and i want to know Thelonious, yes yeah, yeah i wondered that yeah, if it was him. And some of your poems talk to God in a sort of interesting way and, and Monk, and there's a sort of, like there's this sense that there, there's another sort of disembodied being that's there, in like sort of receiving the poetry and, and in this sort of slant, d d silent dialogue with the narrator, which I love in your poems. 
because uh, Reet's saying, felt this in my gut, really, really incredible. What a treat to listen to you. Yeah, and that's why I asked him to go on because I knew you had to log off. <laughs> so I wanted you to get be able to catch the both of the guest poets. Thanks, Zach, for coming. Beautiful. Do you want to talk a little bit about the inspiration for the poetry, Tongo, or anything you wanted to add? Uh, well, I, I, I say in, in a way, I, 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 I try to, um, <clears throat> what a, a, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I, I, I decided that, um, not necessarily inspiration, but, uh, euphoria <clears throat> was, um, was not a friend while writing and, and, and I kind of, put myself in positions where I was forced to write basically bored and cynical. Um, and, and, and through that process, it gave me like a lucidity of craft. Um, almost, and in a way gave the craft itself a kind of like more of a self-awareness um, mm -hmm. and, and, and started kind of building uh, its own little universe. To where I come to kind of understand it is really just a parallel intelligence. And so when it really the the writing doesn't begin with objects or conclude uh, with objects or searches for uh, accomplishment or anything like that, the the idea is just how right can I do by a given thought when I have my hands on it. That's like the opportunity. So in a way, it's almost just like, like intelligence, an intelligence slash opportunity to kind of meditate while thinking, which in most cases is, is uh, seems opposed, or in fact, even while you're technically meditating, you, you know, when you when you find yourself thinking, you say I'm thinking and you return to the breath and this type of thing. But when writing, there's this nice little kind of like they meet this this opportunity really to take your own personal territory out of the uh, uh, the or, or the the main preoccupation, which often, unfortunately, and well, not necessarily, unfortunately, is natural for us. You know what I mean? Like when we talk, of course, we're like we're talking slash creating ourselves at the same time. But when you take that that creation of yourself out of it um, and, and, and really just kind of get into a more nuanced recreation of the entire picture of, of, of bigger pictures, then interesting thing things happen to you that or happen with you that are just kind of like uh, good for you and good for people who read it or, 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 or listen to it. So I think well. So then, I mean, in answer in answer to the question, then the 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 in, the, the inspiration is just kind of like the pursuit of the muscle of writing. Yes. The, the building of the the building and make maintenance of the of the muscle. I think. I so like that idea. Where it go? Where it starts from? Where it's headed? So it it really don't it really don't matter. In fact, I found it real helpful like to really just start super small with no kind of like major task just have something uh, whatever pops into your mind that's like interesting and if it's not interesting some whatever how do you make what pops in your mind a little more interesting you know what i mean like well what what's the interesting thing going on in this room mm -hmm. this room i've come to take for granted but there's something interesting in here that I haven't uh, pushed myself enough uh, when looking at. That's interesting. That's what uh, Nick Mamatas, who teaches a, a sci-fi focused class for us, does that where he says to the students, uh, take three ideas. This is when they're constructing prose and storytelling. But he says, your first idea is no good because <laughs> it's a cliche. your second idea is inversion of the first idea. So it's also a cliche, but your third idea is your best idea. So yeah. then go with that idea, throw the first two away, but you have to kind of iterate the first two, but it's that same, that same sense of like finding, finding the truth and lucidity, thinking very lucidly. And 
it's interesting what you're saying about the opposite of uh, euphoria, because we think, you know, when people romanticize what it means to be an artist or what it means to be a poet, you think, oh, it's just taking drugs and feeling feelings and then like, like listening to music and like, oh, I'm going to write, you know, but it's actually really, or I'm going to make, you know, piano, you know, or I'm going to play piano, but it's really a focused thing, right? That we're training ourselves to do and honing. And it's something that like your best work can be done when you're bored or when you don't fucking feel like it, you know, like when you don't feel like writing. Oh, man. Um, and even and even what what looks like well, you're not digging at the time, and then you look back and like, oh, actually, I've I've climbed a sig a, a significant mountain, mm -hmm. uh, and, and also I, I would I would emphasize that the the trick is to be the creator of the tricks, so so that you know like what, what homeboy I forget his name uh, said you know you got the three thoughts and. X, Y, Z, you know, um, I, I'm sitting here talking about, well, look around, what can you, what have you taken for granted and can make more interesting. The, the moral of the story is that you actually become, the more you go, the more lucid you get, the more you just ask yourself again, like, well, what is poetry in the first place? Or why is this line interesting and this other line isn't? Or what did I do to this line to make it a little bit more interesting? Or why, when, when I say this, people lean in? Why, when I say this, even I start to check out, right? When you have these these conversations, then you become the creator of these equations. And it's kind of like this 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 pedagogy. And that's that's when it's clicking. That's when and that's and, and really that's like the destination, you know. When 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 craft is is this this beautiful kind of immersive living process for you. The rest is just a vic. What what comes out is actually just the victory lap. Is is actually just you know, is your is is your reward how, for for however the experiments go. But that's that that's really the life. Is 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 just the creation of a cosmology of sorts. Like yo, this is how my universe works. This is how it's expanding. You know what I mean? These are the various rules of it. This is how you break them. On and on and on. World building. That's like what sci-fi fantasy writers talk about when they build their world. But every, I guess everybody, every writer does this. Their world building. Or, or build or build your math. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Build your science, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this idea of getting in the zone is very interesting and process begets product. I really like that. Like if you fall in, for those of you who are in method writing with me, we talk a lot about process over product, focus on the process and then move to product later. And I think that's really cool. And and I'm thinking about what you're saying, Tongo, about getting in the zone and about, there's a, a writer, I mean, a, a theorist uh, from, uh, I think, I don't know where he is now, but he was at University of Chicago and his name is Mahali Shiksamahai. And he wrote about zone, getting in the flow and when people get into the zone and how they get there and who are and, and who are the most happy people it's the people that can get into the flow and he studied this idea of like a flow state and how how people are creative creative people get there but it's not always create like his happiest person that he found was this guy who worked for a factory in the midwest and um he was working at a very boring job but his like making the same thing on an assembly line over and over again. But when he went home, he would do all these things to get himself into a flow state where, you know, he had this, like the perfect sprinklers that he built, he, he would tinker. So you can be in the flow in anything. It doesn't have to be an artistic state, but it's very, very meaningful for artists. This concept, I think this idea of flow is very fascinating to me and how we get into the zone and, and how we don't. And so maybe, by this dialogue, it's it's triggering, hopefully, some ideas for you guys, for the um, the artists in this room, and especially beginner and intermediate and advanced. Um, like, how can you get into the flow too, and how can you meditate while thinking and create your own external calculus? And um, anyone else have any thoughts that they want to add to this idea, or anything that you wanted to to? Thank you so much. By the way, it's brilliant. Any other things that it reminded you of or sort of moments of meaning that you wanted to, to sort of highlight? 
anything that was meaningful for you in particular. Radhika saying, I liked hearing your notes on how to write as much as you're writing. Thank you so much. Marilyn said, enjoyed listening to your writing and especially Jennifer and Antoinette as well. Marilyn, do you want to read something? I know you're visiting from our other group, but we love. I, I had something I could read, but unfortunately I can't access it because there's something weird. I did some to our computer this late this morning and uh, that's why it took me so long to get on even. That's okay. Well, we'll just, if you find it, we'll come back to you. Um, who else uh, wants to read? Uh, Giselle, would you like to read? something that you prepared. Um, we had you read your free write, which was wonderful, but do you have something else you want to read? Um, no, not not yet. I, I feel like my piece isn't ready. I'd like to most definitely share it with you all once it is completed. I am close. I like what, what, uh, what Tongo had to say, right when, you know, you're bored. I definitely do that. I think a lot. I, I, yeah, I, I just have to think more about my writing. I, I, it's not yet ready. That's okay. That's, it's in process. That's fine. Um, Stephanie, do you want to read something? And by the I, way, we're recording and we can pause it if anyone wants us to, if you feel like I want to read, but I don't want to be recorded. We can, we can pause. Okay. I'm going to read the pep talk I wrote in class and hopefully you'll be ready and these are just i'm reading from my in-class writing they're not edited they're just um just so that you don't feel bad and also because i'm unprepared and i and hopefully this will encourage you to read so in our class we wrote about our fears um oh radica you want to read okay i'll read the pep talk after you radica you you go ahead are you ready Dear astronauts in writing, and dear astronauts in waiting, when you gazed upon the deadly skies of Venus through your boyhood window, can you hear me? All right, just check. Did you visualize your grown body will float in these foreign clouds within a protective sheath that welcomes Kansas-born lung sacs inhaling buttressed oxygen? Did you fling your dream to a Martian skyscape where your fatherhood frame will stand above North Pole, water molecules that lies trapped beneath the surface. You must know Martian water cannot carry the same heft of home when you drank a tall glass under a big sky blanket with Mars and Venus beaming like undelivered hope. What is it? The other one I think I'll save. Thank you. <laughs> You'll see. Oh, I thought you said the other one you were going to sing. I was waiting for you to sing. Uh -huh. I could sing, but really not in this space. Are you, um, are you, yeah. Yeah. I'm not I think I'm the only person, the only person whose two year old says, two -year -old says <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Are you going to read another one or? Okay. Yeah. I, uh, Aquila is joining us. Okay, so um, Aquila Lewis Ross has joined us from her car, which is the best place um, to have privacy sometimes. Why don't you go ahead? While Aquila is getting ready, I'm gonna read you guys a pep talk and uh, Aquila, let us, uh, let us know when you're ready. Okay, Here's my pep talk to everybody. So if the people who weren't ready, I hope you'll read works in progress because this is mine. Gentle writer, I hear your feelings about not going deep, but you will and you must. You've taken the first step about going deep by coming to this workshop. If you go, if you, if you go too deep, what's the worst that could happen? That you'd become vulnerable, that you'd cry, that you tell too much story. Too much story, dear writer, is the goal. Emotional vulnerability and openness are what connects writers and storytellers to others. And we yearn for that. We yearn to be heard. What if I 
increase my feelings of isolation by sitting alone, you wonder. And that is also an excellent point and a valid fear, dear writer. Writing is isolating, so is the human condition. But all throughout time, human beings have told stories, have yearned for stories. We turn to stories now more than ever in times of physical and emotional and technologically imposed isolation in order to make sense of our world. So write on, my dear writer, write on. Somebody, somebody just like you somewhere else on the opposite side of the world is yearning to hear your exact story. So I wrote that in response to our writing. We, if you were in my class, we just, we all wrote fears and then I, we all wrote pep talks to each other's fear. And if, if you remember, that was my pep talk to whosoever fear I got. And I totally have writing fears too. And it's okay if things are in progress because that's part of what a reading is, is to test and progress work. And that's okay. All right, our final reader. Goodness. Okay, it, it's untitled. Uh, part one, dear Lord, it's been a while, I know, and last time I came to you, I was between the devil and the cold green sea, so all I could do was ask for favors. This time, not that way, but just to offer you a list of experiences for which I'm grateful. For the intro to songs you implant in my head every morning. For Hosier's song, As It Was. For my Irish AA group down the road on Monday. For my sponsor in AA, Ramona, the social worker who asked me, what is a true alcoholic? For Amelia, for arresting my habit of overspending for a 12 week attempt at a business class at Renaissance for a new friend, Priscilla, the physical therapist, and for my potential job offer at Felton, for my cousin, Thomas, for giving me a ride to and from the Thanksgiving family party, for the free acupuncturist who harpoon my knees every time I see them on Clement Street, for the massive amounts of paperwork I gotta do to get physical therapy, right? so I could just tell Nathan, I forgive him for what he couldn't do. Part two, dear Lord, it's me again, Radhika. I've become hard of hearing all of a sudden. What am I supposed to do and choose with my life? How do I know anything apart from you? Help me realize something good before it's too late. Dear Radhika, all the freedom you need is yours. I just want you to be happy. Remember the time you'd left Sparky for Chris and then Chris for no one and you thought you'd be crushed by the subsequent loneliness but you made a new life about that journey you keep committing and then uncommitting to just begin it and stop worrying you'll find some people to help you once you start that is all thanks alexandra i like the stream of consciousness and i like that it's talking to god and it's very interesting um uh, beautiful. I'm going to read, Aquila, can I read yours? I'm just going to read yours for you. Or does anyone else, because she posted it in the chat. And I feel like it should be read out loud because you made the effort to come. So I'll do my best to read it. Unless anyone else wants to read it. Okay. In the Waiting by Aquila M. Lewis Ross. There's no thrill in life's roller coaster. I've desired to get off long ago, but my babe held my hand and smiled her smile like she does. There's a room where home is mastered while weeping on your knees to hear news. Hope is shattered, shattered to get the treatment or surgery, scared to get the treatment or surgery. Controlling my fatness was the most important things that mattered. When the white woman decided I was too busy for therapy, I got fatter. I really like this poem. I feel like it needs more, like that this is the part one and that there's gonna be three parts or five parts or something, but it could be its own poem and then maybe there's another poem after. But it's this idea of access, being denied access and then sort of racism in the, in the medical field 
and the eye is very strong. What I like about your work, Aquila, is the eye. You always have a very strong eye. This is her book, Stop Hurting and Dance. And I like this idea of weeping on your knees to hear news. The you and then the I and how it goes into my. Beautiful. I said, she said, I wish you guys could hear me. I've been going through how to look up my social media, Facebook and Instagram, Aquila M. Lewis Ross. I'm so sorry. I, your daughter's beautiful. And, um, and I love that she made it a cameo in your poem. Uh, Stephanie texted me, but she meant to text you. Um, thank you, Aquila. And anyway, beautiful, beautiful work. And I think it's 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 almost like Murphy's Law because you need a voice the most right now and your voice was cut off, but your voice will always come through in the writing. So keep writing. And I love that you brought in your daughter and I love that you said she's always the star co-star. That's beautiful. And the irony of, of the fact that your your voice got cut off it, it is not lost on us. And yeah, this is beautiful. I mean, you guys have done amazing work this term. If if you have anything else that you want to say, any kind of anything else that you wanted to share, I would love to hear it about the class. I think this is the first of of many of many community collaborations that we're going to have for City Stories Workshop. As the founder of Creative Writing Institute, I love that it enabled us to offer free classes um, to the community. And I, I'm as long as we can afford to, I vow to offer free workshops um, a few times a year so that we can um, grow and partner with other organizations. So I'm, I'm excited that this brought you here. If, if you want to join us uh, for other uh, workshops, we have our fall, our winter schedule is up at sfwriting.institute um, slash events. And uh, I we just have a, two classes scheduled so far. All of our teachers are super tired because of the pandemic. So um, we, you know, we're like slowly putting classes up, but we're really excited to work with you and um, and keep the dialogue going. And we're really, I'm really honored and humbled by the poets who visited. Your work is amazing. And I think that's cool, Aquila, that you used to be the Counterpulse Communications intern four years ago. And yeah, I think that's it, it comes full circle. So it's nice. Rick, Rick Darnell, um, thank you so much to you and Counterpulse for having us. Um, it was a pleasure. And um, if anyone else has any comments they want to make, if you want to make an announcement about Counterpulse at all, um, we'd love to hear it. Um, I just want to say hi, Aquila. I was just wondering where I knew you from. It was Counterpulse. Right. You recognize each other. Let's see. Yeah. Is there anything you want to say about Counterpulse and um, that you wanted to add, Rick? Well, we've loved having um, SFCWI at Counterpulse. You know, it's part of gender art, so we're trying to always bring more work in, performative work, artwork, written work, spoken word. Uh, and if people ever want to do anything at Counterpulse, just write us a little proposal, come by and give it to us, and we can talk about doing stuff. We're lucky to have this big building. We want to see it used, and we're glad that we can be together again. Uh, at this time, we're still asking people to wear a mask when you come to the building. So everyone's always welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Thanks for having me. a lot of good dance shows at Counterpulse. I just want to mention that, too. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. We love doing it. Mm -hmm. Rick, do you guys possibly have space to rent to somebody who's doing like dance instruction for an after school program? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that we have a really nice studio. And my intention a really nice theater. to do it in July. Yeah, I'm Rick at counterpulse.org. You can always write me there. Rick at counterpulse.org. Rick at counterpulse. Got it. And um, thank you. Uh, I'm I'm teaching a free a, a free online class. It's on email. So if you like working with me and you want to keep send doing prompts, uh, you can just sign up for it, and I'll send you guys all the link how to how to sign up at the end of this uh, meeting and uh, you can feel free to sign up. And if you reply to me, I promise to give you feedback. For people who took my class, um, there'll be a place where all of the prompts are housed that you'll have special access to if you wanna submit any work. 
and um, for feedback, but otherwise it was a pleasure working with you. And if you're interested in our paid classes, I have a boot camp coming up called um, Find Your Creative Spark, and it's three days um, at the at the lunch hour in in uh, uh, Zoom, and it's from 11 to 1, uh, January 10th, 12th, and 14th, and it's all about sort of finding your flow with writing and getting on track for the new year. So if you're if that's something that interests you. Would, I'd love to have you. And I know Holly Hardy's teaching a poetry workshop and we hope to be adding some more poetry workshops soon and fiction as well. So um, with that, without keeping you uh, for, for too long, I, I just wanna thank you and for coming. And yeah, and if, if you, I'm gonna turn off the recording and if you guys wanna chat um, and visit, feel free.